This is Greater Gospel Temple and Inspiration of God Ministries, 214-403-7563. This is a day that God has made. I'm rejoicing and I'm glad in this day because God is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endures to all generations and forever. He's a great God. He's an almighty God and I am so thankful to God for giving me my health giving me strength, letting me be in my right mind, giving me the gift of speech, hearing, sight. I thank God for everything that he's doing. He's a wonderful God. He's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful God. And I hope you feel the same way. And if not, after this lesson, after this lesson, I hope that it will change your mind to the positive and that you will have an idea of who God really is if you don't know him, if you don't know him. This is a Sunday school lesson and it's talking about forgiveness and how God is forgiving us. And let me get back to this. We're in Genesis, the third chapter, the 8th through the 17th and the 20th through the 24th verses here. We're in the L.G. Parkhurst version of the Sunday School lesson, and it's based on the International uh, Sunday School lesson. And we are talking about God's gracious forgiveness. God's gracious forgiveness. He is almighty. He's merciful. He's a forgiving God. He's a loving God. I love him. I love him. I love God. My uh, ambition is, my goal is to make it into the kingdom of God. And I believe with all my heart from my life's experiences and from the everything that's happened in my life and the results I've gotten from praying to God, I believe with all my heart that he is the true and the living God and that he does exist. And by the time before this lesson is over, I hope you feel the same way too. We're talking about God's gracious forgiveness. If he had not forgiven me, if he had not made a way for me through his son, Jesus Christ, I would not be forgiven today. I would probably not exist today because he probably, probably would have done away permanently with all mankind, all humankind. I'm so thankful to him because he is who he says he is because of my experiences, my personal experiences with him. He is a true and a living God. We're in Genesis, as I said, third chapter. So I will go and read the scripture. I will read the scripture. Genesis 3, 8 through 17 and 20 through 20. Four. So let me get to the scripture, Bible Gateway. I'm trying to get to Bible Gateway. Where are you, Bible Gateway? There you are. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. Listen to this. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. My goodness, heard his voice walking. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Let me come in on this right here. You know what? All of, out of all of the times that I've read this, out of all of the times that I've listened to other people read it, I this had never grabbed me like it grabbed me just when I read it this time. I heard the voice in the garden. I heard that voice in the garden. And then up here, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. His voice was walking in the garden. My goodness. And he said, I heard that voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And the man said, 
And he said, this is what God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. All right, I'm going on with that. My, my, my. Goodness. Let me get back to this. This is good this morning. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Then we go down to the twenty to the twenty fourth verse. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. My goodness. Let me get to the commentary. Commentary part. My goodness, this is good this morning. As the keeper of the garden, Adam had the responsibility to teach the woman, his wife, his helper, and his partner, not only about the animals and birth uh, and birds and their names, okay, but also about the one and only law that God had given them to obey. When they both disobeyed God, they both learned evil by experience. For the first time, they experienced pain, shame, and separation from each other and God. They lost their ability to reason clearly and thought they could hide themselves from God, their creator. My goodness. See, that's what sin does. It separates us. My God, it separates us. This is quite, quite an experience. My goodness. It separated them. It, oh, let me get on. Let me get on with this lesson. My God loved the man and the woman that God had created in his image. And they communicated in an open and natural way until the man and woman sinned. I mean, they had an open communication with God 
a natural communication with God. They could converse with God directly. My, my, my. Just as happy children will run to loving parents when they hear them come home, Adam and Eve had probably run to God, their heavenly, heavenly parent, whenever they heard God walking in the garden. Based on what the New Testament teaches about Jesus' role in creation, the Lord God could be God the Father and God the Son walking together or the one or the other. And we can see that in John the first chapter and John the 17th chapter. God knew perfectly well where they were hiding, but for the first time to teach them a lesson, God asked, where are you? His question would reveal to them more of the nature of evil and the death of a relationship that they had been brought up on or they had brought upon themselves when they disobeyed God and did evil. My goodness. Adam answered God honestly and expressed his new feelings about himself, feelings of fear and shame. His new experience of knowing evil and his knowledge that he had disobeyed God and the fear of his consequence means his fear of what death might mean to him motivated him to try to hide from God. Death means separation. Death means separation, okay? At physical death, our soul separates from our body and our body returns to the ground to dust until the resurrection. The moment Adam disobeyed God, he separated himself from God, and that had both immediate and lasting consequences, not only for him and his wife, but for the entire human race that will follow them. That's why it's happening like it is now, because the Adam and Eve, he immediately experienced the spiritual death of his loving and open relationship with God and the woman. The process of death began in him, and someday his human body would die. Disobedience. Disobedience to God. My goodness. Even though God knew what was going to happen, he knew exactly what they were going to do, when they were going to do it, how they were going to do it, and everything. But you know what? He gave them a choice, just like he gives us a choice today. God gave them a choice. God continued to ask Adam questions as part of helping Adam come to terms with and understand the consequences of his disobedience. No one told Adam that he was naked. Adam's conscience that God had built within him accused him of being naked, of having something like his sinful actions to hide, a pain that Adam thought he could cure himself by hiding a part of himself, meaning hiding his skin. Adam now experienced sin, shame, and guilt, but he transferred these feelings to now being ashamed of the way God had made him physically, and he covered himself, my, my, my. Now, in some sense, Adam blamed God for having made him naked. If he had not sinned, he would have been open and totally honest before God. Because he had sinned, he hid and would not admit to God, I was afraid of you because I disobeyed you and ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree. Instead, God had to ask Adam directly to take personal responsibility for his choices and actions by asking Adam in so many words, did you disobey me? My, my, my. We are something else, aren't we? But yet God loves us in spite of everything. He loves us. He cares for us. He gives us a chance to repent and accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior so that we can still be in communication with God. We cannot communicate with God except, S-E-X-C-E-P-D, we go through Jesus Christ. 
That's the only way we can get to God now. And Adam had direct, direct communication with God. So when he did this and disobeyed God, then things changed, okay? Now, first Adam blamed God for not making him good. For Adam said he was naked. Adam and the woman probably hid from one another too. Now, I won't go so far as to say that. I won't do that. But this is a commentator. This is his version. And this is what he's commenting on. Okay? Adam and the woman, he said Adam and the woman probably hid from one another too because they were naked and tried to cover themselves in front of one another. See Genesis 3 verse 7. All right. Genesis 3 verse 7. Let me go there. Genesis 3, verse 7. I said we might not have started there. But okay, go go Genesis 3, verse 7 for yourself, okay? He knew that when God saw him, that he would see that he had disobeyed God, so he both covered himself and hid from God. God had made the man good, and God had made the man naked. Though made good, Adam freely chose to disobey God and then thought his being naked was bad. Second, Adam blamed God for not giving him a good woman. For Adam said that she was the one who gave him the fruit to eat. Okay? And she was. He blamed it on the woman, but he was the man. Okay? So I'm going to leave it right there. Now, however... From reading Genesis 1, we know that God made everything good and God had made the man and the woman good in his image. The fact that Adam had misused his abilities and blamed God for not making him the, and the woman good in his opinion reveals something of the depth of the separation between Adam and God. Isn't it amazing how just like that, we can be separated from God. My goodness. And the growing experience of evil in the lives of the man and the woman in their relationship. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Whew. I'm going to read that again because it's so important. The fact that Adam has, had misused his abilities and blamed God for not making the man and the woman good, okay? For not making him and his woman, quote, end quote, good, in his opinion, reveals something of the depth of the separation between Adam and God, between Adam and the woman, and the growing experience of evil in the lives of the man and the woman in their relationship or plural relationships. The evil that the woman experienced led her to try to deceive her husband into eating the forbidden fruit rather than warn him to not eat the forbidden fruit because she had eaten and had suffered damaging results. Now I could, I could comment on that. I really could. But I will not at this time, okay? But I want to do this. This is I tell you, this is someone else's commentary, but I like this commentary, okay? I might not always agree with what the commentator uh, comments on, okay? But it's a good, good Sunday school lesson, okay? The evil that the woman experienced led her to try to deceive her husband into eating the forbidden fruit rather than warn him not to eat the forbidden fruit because she had eaten and had suffered damaging results, all right? Now, that right there can be dealt with later on, all right? Now, God knew all the facts in the situation, but he examined both Adam and Eve through questions because both the man and the woman were responsible for their choices. And as their parent and teacher, God needed to bring this awareness to their consciousness. All right. When Eve learned what evil was by experience, 
she became morally and spiritually corrupted. Therefore, she wanted to involve Adam, her partner, in evil too. This is unreasonable, but it is part of the nature of evil in people. They try to spread their evil infection to others. So we can see 2 Timothy, Timothy the third chapter, and the uh, 13th verse. Rather than take responsibility for her choices, Eve blamed the serpent. The New Testament reminds us that Eve was deceived, but Adam was not deceived. See 1 Timothy, the second chapter, and the 14th verse. Now that I want to come in on. God gave the direction to Adam. Adam directed Eve. So when Eve was deceived by the serpent, then she just wanted her husband to try it. Say, oh, this is something. This is something special. You ought to try it. And because of him and his weakness to that, he tried it. So when he did it, that's when the sin came about because he knew what God had told him. He went against what God had told him. And so we, I would not lay all the responsibility on her because the direction was given to Adam. And we know that the change, dramatic change, did not come until after Adam partook of the fruit. All right? Now, we know from other scriptures that the serpent is Satan. Satan later tempted Job to sin, but Job did not fall for Satan's tricks. Satan also tempted Jesus in the wilderness, but Jesus defeated Satan when he chose not to disobey God, his father. God knew that Satan was not teachable, so God passed judgment against Satan immediately without discussion. There's no need for us to discuss anything with Satan, who is a deceiver. God judged that Satan would have a miserable life all the days of his life. Now let me get back to the woman. The woman is the weaker vessel. And because she's the weaker vessel, then God, the devil, the serpent, chose to go to the weaker vessel. And he also knew that she had influence on her husband. So he knew all of this. God knew it all too. Okay? So that's the avenue that Satan took to get to Adam. So we have to really, really be careful. And some people say, well, I'm not weak. I'm not weak. I'm just as strong as a man. We're not just as some, you know, depending on the conditions, the body types and all of that. Now, some women are stronger than some men in a sense, physically. But then God knew what he was doing. He put the man here to be our protector, to be our husband's to watch over us, to be a provider for the family, and all of that. God knew what he was doing. And when he says that we were the weaker vessel, then Satan knew that Eve uh, mentally, in that sense, okay, was the weaker vessel. He could get to her before he could get to Adam. And that's why he chose Eve. Because Eve had a sense of naivety, okay, a naivety, however we want to pronounce it, she was naive, and she fell for it. And then that influence that she had over Adam caused him to partake, and then they both sinned. All right? Now, God declared that Satan, with his demonic offspring, and the woman with her children, would forever be enemies, where the, all the woman's children would admit that Satan was their enemy or not. Jesus spoke about the characteristics of the children of, of the devil. And we can see that in John, the 8th chapter, and the 44th verse, filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul called the magician, Elimus, a son of the devil. And we can see that in Acts the 13th chapter, the 8th through the 12th verses. Satan and his demonic offspring do all they can to destroy men, women, and children 
physically, morally, mentally, and spiritually. Satan and his offspring do everything they can to destroy us, to get us off track, to make us fall from the way. Or people who have not accepted Jesus Christ, he tries to keep them from accepting, repenting, and accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And those who have repented and accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, he tries to get us off track. Because he doesn't want anybody to be saved because he cannot be saved again himself. God declared this to warn men, women, women and children not to make peace with Satan who is evil and who would require them to be and do evil as a condition of peace with him. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is the only one who can bring true and lasting peace to people. Those created in the image of God must always fight against Satan and evil. We must always fight against Satan and evil. These uh, or those created in the image of God must always fight against Satan and evil. We must always fight against Satan and evil. In this verse, God speaks for the very first time of Satan's ultimate defeat. Satan would strike the heel of the Messiah, Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross. On the other hand, Jesus would strike Satan's head because Jesus defeated Satan and death when he rose from the dead. Jesus will someday decisively and publicly strike Satan's head. One spiritual consequence of sin is people uh, must never make peace with Satan. People must fight Satan whenever he or his offspring tempt people to do evil. We must fight him. We must fight him. This battle will last until Jesus Christ comes again. The battle will last until Jesus Christ comes again. I need to do something to, to help my voice. A physical consequence of sin was God's direct punishment for the woman's disobedience. And this consequence will have an effect on all women until Jesus Christ comes again. However, her desire for her husband would overcome her shame at being naked before him and her desire to avoid the pain of childbearing so the human race would continue. These consequences serve as reminders to people not to sin again because here are, excuse me, there are natural, spiritual, and judicial consequences when people sin, there are natural painful consequences of sin because we have violated our human nature as created by God. And there are judicial consequences to sin, consequences that God judges we must suffer for our sins unless we repent and return to faith in God and in Jesus who suffered the judicial consequences of sin that we deserve. Jesus suffered it for me, for you, okay? God did not curse the man or the woman. God designed suffering from sin to restrain the growth and spread of sin. The consequences of sin gave people a reason to fight against Satan's temptations rather than continue to follow his suggestions to disobey God. Sinners will often try to mislead others into sin, as the woman misled her husband, so believers must think, pray, and rely on God to avoid being misled. Now let me talk about this. Yes, people are going to entice you. They're going to get you, well, you just do this. Oh, you just do this. There's no harm in it. No harm in it. But let me tell you. The responsibility lies on you as to whether you give in, you yield to this temptation or not. The responsibility is totally upon you. 
You are responsible for your soul. You are responsible for you. So now that we know that we're going to be tempted, then the responsibility lies on us as to whether we yield to that temptation or not. All right. To survive, people would now need to fight against weeds and struggle and toil to make the ground grow food to meet their needs. With less leisure time and more effort needed to survive, some people would be less likely to waste their time in sinful activities and the misleading of others. And they said, uh, what is it? Uh, what is it? Let me see. Uh, what is it about the mind is a devil's workshop? So that means if your mind is not preoccupied with doing good or being busy, then it's the devil's workshop. Okay? The devil can work on your mind if you're not busy doing the things that need to be done as God has told us and instructed us to do all right now. An idle mind is a devil's workshop. That's what it is, okay? Adam first called his wife woman, and we can see that in Genesis, the second chapter and 23rd verse. Because she would bear children, Adam named her Eve, which can be translated as source of life, all right? God drove them out of the garden, so they could not eat of the tree of life and live forever in sin and shame. Because God came to save those who had died or would die with the biblical faith in the tree, God believers now have access to the tree of life. See Revelation 2 verse 7 and Revelation 22 and 2 and then 14 and then 19. Okay, those verses. Jesus needed to come and change people before they could truly enjoy eternal life now and also live forever. Other than eating plants, Adam and Eve had never seen or experienced death. So they did not know what physical death meant until God taught them the meaning by experience. God graciously put an animal to physical death instead of Adam and Eve. An animal had to die for the Lord to cover them, and they saw what death meant for the first time. My goodness, my, 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 just think what it's going to be like when we get to the kingdom of God. My goodness. Now, their sin brought about the death of an animal, probably one of their friends or companions. This is commentary. And someday they would die too. They could not clothe themselves to cover their shame successfully. Only God could do that with the sacrifice of an animal. They learned about animal sacrifices from God. Later they would make and teach their children to make sacrifices approved by God. Perhaps they were commanded to only sacrifice lambs, perhaps, okay? Now later, Jesus, the Son of God, also called the Lamb of God, would die to remove our sins, our guilt, our shame, and rise again to clothe us with his righteousness so we could enter the kingdom of heaven and spend eternity with God in open, honest, loving communication. I'm looking forward to that day. We go through so many trials and tribulations here in this world because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Now, God has made a way through Jesus Christ for us to be forgiven, for us to be happy here on earth and then go into the kingdom of God and live there forever and never have to worry about another evil or depressing or hurting thing again. The Lord knew that obeying God was good and disobeying God was evil. God also knew evil secondhand after the angels rebelled against God. God never experienced evil personally by doing evil, for all God does is good and wise. God is love and light, and there is no darkness in God. He's love and light. There's no darkness in him. Now, after Adam and Eve sinned, they came to know evil firsthand by personal experience. The day evil 
excuse me, the evil they did separated them from one another from God. Before they sinned, they could have eaten from the tree of life forever because that was not forbidden by God until after they disobeyed the Lord. Huh. All right, now, he told them not to eat of the tree of good and evil, but they could have eaten from the tree of life forever because that was not forbidden by God until they disobeyed God. Got it. Okay. Now, God had told Adam to manage the creatures, put under his authority as their benevolent ruler, just as the Lord managed Adam and Eve as their benevolent ruler. Now, after they rebelled against God by disobeying the only law the Lord gave them, they not only suffered the true moral guilt that led to their separation from God and one another, they also suffered God's just discipline. From that time forward, they would no longer be able to just eat the delicious fruit hanging from the trees. They would need to work the ground to provide food for themselves to eat. Until the Lord restored all creation, they would never be able to enter the Garden of Eden again. The Lord sent angels called cherubim to guard their only entrance into the Garden of Eden on the east side of the garden and use flaming Use a flaming sword to deter a casual or forced entry. King Solomon put gold-plated images of cherubim in the Holy of Holies when he built the temple. You can see that in 1 Kings, the sixth chapter. Since the time of the flood in the days of Noah, the location of the Garden of Eden has been lost. My goodness. Now we're talking about God's gracious forgiveness. He forgives sin. And so when we're now that we're at this point, all you have to do if you have not asked for forgiveness or if you're in a backslidden state, say, God, I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me in the name of Jesus. And I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. That's all you have to do for that part to be, be forgiven. Now, you ask God to guide you, lead you to a, a congregation where there's a sanctified leader, okay? And he will do that for you. If you're not already in one, he will lead you. And then if you're in one, he will reassure you that you're in the right place, okay? Because we do need direction. We do need the fellowship that God has ordained it, okay? God's gracious forgiveness. God gave Adam and Eve the choice to obey or disobey him. If they obeyed God, they could eat of the tree of life and live forever. If they disobeyed God, they would no longer have access to the tree of life and they would surely die. If they chose to obey God, they would only know good forever and enjoy a happy and satisfying relationship with God, their growing family, uh, and their growing family as they fill the earth and exercise their God-given roles as benevolent rulers of the creatures that would be their companions forever. Unhappily, Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and break the only law God had given. My goodness. And what God said would happen, happened. They immediately, immediately experienced a new evil firsthand, unlike God, who only knows evil secondhand. They immediately suffered true moral guilt and experienced separation from each other. They felt ashamed, and later they tried to hide from God. Among other consequences, this experience, or these experiences, were built into their human nature. For this reason, when we sin, we suffer these 
are similar moral consequences unless we have made our conscience ineffective by repeatedly choosing to disobey God because God loves people, God forgave Adam and Eve and helped them cover themselves more effectively. And before they died, God allowed them to live hundreds of years and begin to fill the earth with their children. Still, their disobedience had a devastating effect on their family and on all their descendants. Therefore, God sent Jesus into the world. He sent Jesus into the world so that we would have access to eternal life. God is good. God is good. And, and there's a cliche all the time. And then they say all the time, God is good. And it's a fact. It's a fact. I love you. Enjoy the remainder of your day. This is Greater Gospel Temple and Inspiration of God Ministries right here in Dallas, Texas at 214-403-7566. Two, uh, GGT Church and Inspiration of God Ministries. GGT Church and IOG Ministries. Enjoy the remainder of your day. This is Sunday. It's September the 30th. Oh my goodness. It's the last of this month. This year is almost over. 